Greetings, and thank you so much for joining us for worship with the Falls Church Episcopal today. My name is Kelly Moody, and I am the Associate Rector at the Falls Church, and I'm so glad that you are here with us. Before our worship begins, just a couple of quick community announcements. The first is that we have restarted our Facebook watch parties. So if you are someone who is wishing that you might have a little bit more community involvement while you're participating in our digital worship, if you wish you could talk to some other parishioners during our worship, then we invite you to log on to Facebook, to the Falls Church's Facebook page at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. And there you'll see some other folks from the Falls Church, maybe even some newcomers, and have an opportunity to chat back and forth, worship live with some other members of our community, just a way to continue to stay engaged if that's something that's a preference for you. Also want to say thank you for a whole host of different things. We just overflow with gratitude this week. First, a big thank you to everyone who participated in the silent stand for racial justice with the Falls Church Presbyterian this past Friday at 5 p.m. We had a great group of folks that were there. So glad that you could join us. That's gonna be happening every two weeks, so you can join us again for that soon. Also a big thank you to everybody that helped out with our Vacation Bible School this past week. The magical Hogwarts theme was a big hit with the 71 children who participated in the program. It was just an absolute blast and we had so much fun watching all of those videos this week. So if you were a volunteer who helped to make that happen, thank you for doing so. And a big thanks to Lauren Breeden, our Director of Children and Family Ministries for helping us get that done. And now let us prepare ourselves for worship. Let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Thanks be to God. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness, 
and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not, and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may be also glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we, ourselves, who have the fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies, for in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 139, verses 1 through 11 and 22 through 23. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make the grave my bed, you are also there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand will lead me and your right hand hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light around me turn to night, darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. Search me out, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my restless thoughts. 
Look well, whether there be any wickedness in me and lead me in the way that is everlasting. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus put before them another parable. The parable, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat among, along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom <clears throat> of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. As I said to some of you in coffee hour last week, I don't have a cucumber or anything to keep up with Kelly's demonstration, but we do, uh, we do continue uh, the theme of agriculture. Uh, this time we have a bad seed who has invaded the good crop. And in a homiletics class I had uh, in seminary, one of my professors talked about the main idea, that we should have a main idea, and not always share that, uh, but this time, I'm going to share that with you right up front and to show you what I'm aiming at throughout here. And this is my main idea for the sermon. Outside forces threaten to throw us off the path of following God and becoming more Christ-like. But you might ask, what are such outside forces? And to get a closer look, I'd like to look at a couple of key temptation stories in the Bible. First, let's go back to Genesis. Adam and Eve in the garden created good. They were totally free, well, almost totally free. One condition was placed on the couple. They were not supposed to eat of the tree in the middle of the garden or they would die. And many of you know this story. Along comes the cunning serpent who comes along and convinces the couple to partake of the forbidden fruit. Somehow the serpent convinces them that they're missing out on something, that 
they won't really die, that really there's something good for them to have if they eat that fruit. And so in the end, they go against the desire of God and they, and they follow the serpent. The serpent didn't seem so bad, but the serpent was highly cunning and deceptive and led them exactly against what God would hope for them. The very thing God told them not to do, the serpent convinced them to do, and they are met with God's disappointment and punishment. Yes, the evil influence at least one part of the day. Looking to Jesus in the New Testament, Jesus is also tempted, and the tempter, Satan, picks an opportune time to take advantage of him. He's in the wilderness. He's suffering. He's hungry. And at this low point, yes, Satan comes and begins to tempt him not once, but three times. He's hungry. He's in need. He's tempted with food, bread. When that doesn't work, Satan tempts him with notoriety or fame, finally with power. Is offering Jesus something that Satan thinks might appeal to him. And yet, on each account, Jesus says no, because he knew that by bowing down and obeying Satan, he would have been straining the relationship with his heavenly father. And unlike the couple, Jesus stands firm. We know about temptation and evil in the Episcopal Church. Indeed, we talk about these kinds of things in our Lord's Prayer. Uh, we talked about resisting evil or being delivered from evil and in our baptismal covenant. So the idea of something evil or something bothering us or something attempting to pull us away from God, this is something we talk about in the Episcopal Church. Which brings me squarely back to the Gospel reading where a farmer plants wheat only to have it invaded by weeds overnight while he's asleep. Bad seeds planted by the enemy designed to sabotage his crops, something the first century audience would have understood. Crops were trying to grow them and bad seed that work against the bounty of the crop. In fact, ancient texts even talk about the practice of sabotaging another's crop and punishment and the punishment that would be brought forth from such an act. But let's look at this wheat for a moment. Such imposter wheat looks like the real thing. So you can't just rip it up because you run the risk of pulling up the good wheat. The bad seed looks a lot like the good in the early stages, and it has a way of tangling its roots around the other. So you have to wait to harvest time. You can't just weed it. It grows side by side and looks like the same thing when in reality, it's not good and even is known to be poisonous. The wheat, the good fruit with the mimic wheat, just as good as the wheat is, the mimic wheat is not good. In fact, one of the names of this wheat-like weed is the bearded darnel. What a name, the bearded darnel. And the audience would have recognized that there was such a thing as the bad seed or that with the tear that got in the way of the good crop. Especially problematic for struggling farmers who are just trying to scratch a living out of the soil. The last thing they needed was anything working against the production of their crop, a good and pure crop, a wholesome crop. Again, the weed does not seem that harmful, but it is not good, nor is it what you think it is, even poisonous. Jesus goes on to say good seeds, 
In other words, God's people lead the good works while the weeds do not. And the image I really have of this story is one in which God's people, people like us, are encountered by voices and influences, things that are close by all around us that we may not even recognize. These influences can be damaging to our faith and our ability to follow God closely. Such distractions from the outside may not seem to be harmful at first, but they are. In the book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis creates this situation as he often does with his imagination. He creates a situation in which a senior devil, Screwtape, is attempting to train the younger devil, Wormwood, in the ways of tempting people. And the one Wormwood is trying to learn how to tempt is called the patient. And in C.S. Lewis's creative way, the enemy with a capital E is God. And so the task of the demon, young Wormwood, is to learn how to pull the patient, the Christian, away from God. And as many young devils would want to do, he's an, he's an upstart. He would want to go out and make a bang with the biggest temptation possible. But the senior devil, Wormwood, instructs the young tempter that it's not always the big thing sometimes that do the best job in making the Christian stumble. Sometimes it's the small things. For example, and I quote directly from C.S. Lewis's book, the older devil telling the younger devil to pay attention to the small things. And I'll read directly. Quote, you will say that these are very small sins. And doubtless, like all young tempters, you're anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate man from the enemy. In other words, young tempter, to the point to which you separate the Christian from God. Continuing the quote, it does not matter how small the sins are provided. It does not matter how small the sins are provided that they provide a cumulative effect. The cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signpost, and this is from, to the young tempter, this is from your affectionate uncle, screw tape. In other words, don't worry just about the spectacular sins. The small ones have a very subtle way of separating someone from the Lord, from God. The small sins lead to patterns that can take us away from our faith. But where might such temptations come from in our life right now? There are times in our life when we begin hanging around with certain people or we're in certain circles at work and we hear certain messages and we see certain things going on and we don't really want to take a stand against it because it might rock the boat and yet we don't feel good about the way things are happening we know something's wrong, but we find our way over, we find our a way to overlook it to the point that we even begin to get comfortable with a kind of injustice which we know is not right and know is not where we should be as a child of God. Falling away from deliberate times of prayer and study feeling like, well, today I don't want to pray at all because I don't feel like it. 
I don't need to study. I don't need community. When we do need community in the church, we are nurtured by study and prayer and yet becoming lax and falling away from that make us more susceptible to these subtle and deceptive influences that might come our way. A good prayer life is a way of insulating ourselves, a way of strengthening us, not for if the temptation come, for when it comes. Developing healthy habits of faith do help, even though we don't always feel the immediate benefit. And what about when there's some chasm between us and someone we care about or someone we have wronged or perhaps someone who's wronged us? And we know that there needs to be a face-to-face. -face. On some occasions, I know for me, I'm the one that has to apologize. For other occasions, someone else apologized to me and I need to have an open heart to allow sincere apology. What are those strained relationships that take up energy and fill us with negative thoughts that perhaps it's time to try to bring out some reconciliation with God's help. Maybe we need to call somebody. Maybe we need to look to love someone who is not particularly loving. Maybe we need to look to love someone who has harmed us even. We are children of the light, and yet we live in the presence of weeds. It's not all weeds. There's a lot that's great, but the weeds are there. Things that are unhealthy are close by. May God give each one of us open eyes and clear vision to see what's what so we can draw closer to Christ. I will pray for you, and I hope you'll pray for me as we take steps forward and do our best to not become entangled in the weeds. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we may all be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all priests, bishops, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. 
Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for healing in mind, body, and spirit for Cassidy Dale, Pam Spofford, Carl Close, Martha Close, Hewitt Ebert, Elijah Zay, Michael Gardner, Bishop Susan Goff, Chris Thayer. For Michael Cordes, Alec Erickson, Clara Gilbert, Alan Gottschall, Sandy Haslam, Audrey Smith Herring, Rita Kettler, Sarah Larson, the Reverend Charles T. Mason, Patricia Mathis, Ann Miley, Deborah Houghton Schmidt, Karina Shakur, Clara Sloyan, Tim Smith, Chris Ray. And for any others on your hearts and minds today. We pray for all those serving on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we ask all this, believing that you are the Spirit who is with us now and hears all our prayers. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. If you are with other people right now, I invite you to exchange a sign of God's peace. If you're by yourself right now, we invite you to pick up the phone later today, call a family member or a friend, and wish them the peace of God. Thank you so much for being with us today. And now let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. A prayer for the power of the Spirit among the people of God. God of all power and love, we give thanks for your unfailing presence and the hope you provide in times of uncertainty and loss. Send your Holy Spirit to enkindle in us your holy fire. Revive us to live as Christ's body in the world, a people who pray, worship, learn, break bread, share life, heal neighbors, bear good news, seek justice, rest and grow in the spirit. Wherever and however we gather, Unite us in common prayer and send us in common mission that we and the whole creation might be restored and renewed through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we could ask or even imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Christ, and the Comforter be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord.